Well, it's it's a, a delight to be back at Greencroft, and uh, I see many familiar faces. And so, thanks for welcoming me back. These are these are just such difficult days, and these are difficult issues. You know, the uh, the intersection of um, religion, faith, culture, politics is fraught with all kinds of landmines. And whenever we've been here, uh, you've graciously welcomed me and we've uh, had uh, just good conversations about these issues. And you welcomed some of my friends, most recently from Bethlehem this past summer. So thank you for that. And thanks for welcoming me today. Um, as, of, as of November 16th in Gaza, and this is uh, the latest, the latest uh, uh, numbers from the Palestinian Ministry of Health. Uh, and so to, uh, November 16th is the latest that we have. We've been having trouble getting information out to us. So what is that, four or five, four days ago? 12,012 people killed in Gaza, including 4,900 children, 32,300 wounded. And in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, 216 Palestinians killed. So um, here we go. Wherever you are on this issue, wherever you are, um, our humanity is being tested and our morality is being tested. And so I say that about myself as well. So uh, for those of you who consider yourselves religious, um, deep in prayer, reflection about this, uh, and in conversation with uh, with your own conscience, uh, and I include myself in that. So a little bit about me, part of my personal story. You know, 1945, the late 40s, took I mean, it took 20, 30 years uh, uh, for for the just to kind of reflect about and, and and integrate that trauma in their lives, and so. There was a group of pastors and rabbis in St. Louis who gathered together, eight of each, and we gathered each other's homes for uh, a good number of years. We gathered monthly, and I was part of that group that was invited to do that. And so I became very sensitized to uh, anti-Semitism, Christian anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism in the New Testament, anti-Semitism in early Christian history, anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages, which was my, which was my PhD emphasis. So I, I come at this already, already with uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue emphasis and with a sensitivity toward anti-Semitism. I was part of uh, uh, the groundbreaking and the dedication of the St. Louis Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. Now this is a new building, the Kaplan Center that just opened up last, last year, a year ago. But the original one, and I interviewed Holocaust survivors from the St. Louis area. So again, I want you to factor this, in, factor this in as I speak later. We should also be clear that we mourn every life lost, right? And uh, we, can, we can condemn Hamas's uh, attack on non-combatants uh, and still support uh, the liberation of Palestine. So we condemn we condemn Hamas's attacks uh, on October the 7th. Uh, uh, and yet we can still be very clear in our support of Palestinians. And we'll talk about that more. Because here, here's, here's the issue for us. Context is important. Context is important. We have to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, what would cause, what would cause this attack? This was not unprovoked. It wasn't done for folk, no matter what you hear in the media, this had to come from somewhere. Well, where? That's the question that we're asking. We have the breakup of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, that's 1916, that's not 2016. <laughs> <laughs> the Franklin got me my computer. Uh, in uh, 1916, you had the uh, uh, so called Sykes Picot uh, agreement, where the colonial powers, the colonial powers uh, just carved up the Middle East, and of course, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this is the, uh, 
the uh, um, the result of colonial meddling, colonial occupation in the Middle East. Every time the UK, or Portugal, or France, or the United States meddles in the Middle East, whether it's Palestine, or Syria, or Lebanon, or Iraq, or Iran, they leave more problems than when they came. So the Balfour Declaration supporting the establishment of a Jewish state by the way, Lord Balfour of Christian Zionists. We'll talk about Christian Zionism, I hope, during the uh, question and answer period. I don't spend a lot of time on it here. But somebody asked me about it because it's a real issue. Um, Lord Balfour of Christian Zionists. And by the way, I may repeat this in the Q&A. Christian Zionism, which began in the mid-19th century, precedes Jewish Zionism. Precedes the Zionism among the Jews. Christian Zionism is not a small problem. End of the British mandate. Uh, the UN uh, partitions up, uh, partitions up uh, Palestine and leaves just 22% uh, of the land for Palestinians. In 1947 and 1948, and you know, we, we just discovered this in the last 20 years or so, maybe 25 years, these Jewish-Israeli historians, Jewish-Israeli historians, uh, through Israel's own Freedom of Information Act, uncover some of the original documents from the Zionist era. And they uncover uh, what's called Plan Dalit. Dalit is the Hebrew word for D. It's just the letter D, so Plan D. And what did they discover? Uh, they discover an ethnic clan cleansing plan, plan dollar. And so you can read, right? It's a conquest. They know that there are people in this land. It's not a land for a people in a people in a, uh, in a land without people, right? They know that there are people there, and they know that if if the Zionist agenda is to be realized that the people who are living there have to somehow leave. Mass transfer, population transfer, those are euphemisms, right, for ethnic cleansing. <laughs> and so it's requested by First Prime Minister Mr. David Ben-Gurion, <clears throat> and it's implemented by the paramilitary group Lagunum. And it calls for the conquest of Palestinian towns and villages, and they're to be expelled. They're just to be eliminated. And the people transfer. If the people want to stay, but stay under military rule, if they just sort of submit, mushroom, okay. Otherwise, out. Forcefully or just transfer. It's really a sinister, sinister plan. And it's very little known. And again, I'll just say it was uncovered for us by Israeli Jewish historians, Benny Morris and Ilan Pape. That are the two. And by the way, you see on your handout, uh, we, it, it's, it's uh, uh, spelled out pretty clearly in Ilan Pape's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, by Jewish Israeli historian. 1948, the State of Israel declares independence, and 450 or more uh, Palestinian villages destroyed. Uh, while the world was celebrating a homeland for the Jews, 750,000 Palestinians, three quarters of a million, become refugees in their own land or in the diaspora. The Gazans, the Gazans are descendants of those refugees. Many of them, many of them uh, uh, are forced into Gaza. I served this, I've been hanging around this uh, little church in Bern, the Emmaus Road Mennonite Fellowship, and I've been helping out during their interim. And uh, you can walk on the road to Emmaus today, but ancient Emmaus has been destroyed. 
1980s, the Jerusalem law formalizing the annexation of East Jerusalem. And Israel uh, annexes the Golan Heights. And under the previous administration, uh, you remember uh, the U.S. recognizing Israel, going against 40 years of previous U.S. Uh, policy. Um, the previous administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And uh, um, I mean, that's a whole other story. I, uh, a coin was issued in, I don't want to get into this too much, I get, I get off the subject, but I should have had a slide up there. You can look it up. A coin was issued in uh, Israel with uh, the picture of the previous president on one side. And if you flipped it over, you had a picture of King Cyrus uh, 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 from, you know, biblical times, from the Old Testament, who brought, from, you know, Babylonian, from the children of Israel in Babylonian captivity, and Cyrus, at, what was it, 536 uh, or so, 538 BCE, sent whoever wanted to head back to, the, to uh, uh, Palestine and rebuild the temple. Uh, and so in the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament, he was called, he's, he's the only non-Jew in the Bible called the Messiah. Well, in Israel in 2017, a coin was minted with the previous president on one side and Cyrus on the other side. This non-Jew was looked at as the Messiah because he brought, he established the capital of Israel in Jerusalem. An unholy marriage. 1993, the Oslo Accords. It was supposed to be the capstone, right, of a, of a, of the uh, uh, of peace. And of course, it was a lousy peace because uh, uh, it uh, separates Jordan. Uh, it uh, it opens up. The, it was supposed to be no new settlements built. Well, 500,000 new settlers since 1993 now live in the West Bank. Israel maintains full control. You've got all these little ropes carving up the West Bank now. And it makes and it made the Palestinian Authority, which is one of the reasons why they're distrusted today by their own population. It makes the Palestinian Authority uh, complicit with Israel in policing its own population. So Israel controls the whole apparatus. And so, and, and it controls the Palestinians authority, Palestinian authorities policing of their own population. If you want to know, I'm looking around and most of you are over 40 in this room. If you think of, if you think of, if you think Palestinian authority, you think Vichy, World War II, Vichy. Does that, yeah. you, you get it, right? Okay. This is what, this is why Oslo Peace Accords, when, when, when we in the West think peace, oh, wonderful, peace process, peace talks, this is what peace looks like to the Palestinians. When, when I live in Bethlehem, when I take my peace to Bethlehem, we're staying at the Major Square Hotel, we look out the windows, we see what's on the bottom. And in the mid-80s, this hill looked, looked like it does above, even in 97, but in the mid-80s, it was, it was deemed... A, uh, a green space by the Jerusalem municipality so that it could be maintained as an environmental uh, an environmental uh, uh, space for uh, um, the area. Well, little did they know that when the Jerusalem municipality designated this, it wasn't designated for a green space, even though that's what it was in public. It was meant for a new settlement. And so now you have 40,000 people. I mean, this is 2005, this picture. That way I could get it on one slide. But it, but today there's 40,000 people living on in Harmoma. Jebel Abu Ghanai. And by the way, the people who I talked to in Bethlehem today, remember as kids, people your age, and, and their kids, remember as children, using this as a picnic space. They'd go out, this is, this is in Bethlehem, as a picnic space to go out and uh, all kinds of trees. There's a couple of shrines, religious shrines there that hold some traditions about 
you know, the wise men stopping off or the Virgin Mary stopping to rest on their way to the, you know, to give birth. I mean, all these wonderful traditions and picnic areas and flora and fauna and 40,000 now settlers illegally living inside the Palestinian territories here in Harboma. This is when we in the West, when Israel talks about peace process, Palestinians check their wallet to make sure that they're not going to get ripped off somehow. This is what peace looks like to Palestinians. And so you have on your hand uh, and uh, uh, you can see the map here. So 22% was left for the, 22% of their indigenous land uh, in, uh, uh, after, uh, after World War II. And now, even that, even the West Bank, even the West Bank that was left for them by the UN is carved up and there's about, oh, 9 to 10% left uh, today. Um, Mitri Rahab, the Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem, says that uh, um, the West Bank is, uh, uh, what, how does he say, it's like a big donut where the, uh, the uh, Israelis get the donut real up with the holes. <laughs> so let's talk about God. Mm -hmm. By the way, God is in you see the little strip of land at the, uh, uh, next to the Mediterranean? You see the, the Gaza Strip there? So that we're talking Gaza. I, what's the population of Elkhart? 220,000. Okay. 2.4 million people live in uh, one third of the county, one third of the size of Elkhart Town. About $1,000 uh, approximately. Uh, in per capita in your income, fifty percent under the age of eighteen. So just just keep that in mind. Sixty percent unemployment. So you saw in the previous couple slides back that uh, Israel supposedly left Gaza in 2005. And, you know, Israel, and, and, and the Israel propaganda machine, as well as our own corporate own media in this country, where you keep reminding us, right, that Israel left Gaza in 2005, and look what happened. Well, what happened was, is that they, they pulled out their settlers, and by the way, you know where they sent the settlers? Into the West Bank, into the West Bank. Uh, uh, depopulating other Palestinian uh, places. That's another story. But then they then they proceeded to uh, 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 impose a blockade around Gaza. Land, sea, and air. In fact, they moved the twenty thousand mile, uh, uh, twenty mile, twenty mile uh, 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 fishing area into five miles into the Mediterranean. So the fishermen, which of course that's one of the major economic uh, uh, job sectors in Gaza, moved for 20 miles into five months. Land, sea, and air. Uh, so they remove the settlers, but they don't really leave. They're still engaged. And in fact, there's blockades. Our gala speaker just this last couple of weeks was on one of the way to Arif from Detroit. Was, and I really recommend that you invite her sometime to come here. She'd love to, I bet. Uh, she was one of the uh, uh, folks who uh, was on a flotilla that broke the blockade uh, a number of years ago. 2000, I should have, should have written that. I think it was 2,917 calories per day that they allowed in per person, that the Israelis allowed in on trucks during this blockade. I mean, this is a when I say blockade, nobody, nothing, in or out, except where Israel allows it. Military incursions, crop dusters that spread uh, poison on farm fields, uh, and yet 
we, our tax dollars, $3.8 billion a year. By the way, up from $3.1 billion by President Obama. President Obama. So Gaza, we often hear it called the, the world's largest open. By the way, I am going to get to Hamas. I am going to get to Hamas. It's been called the world's largest open air prison, but it's worse than that. It's a it's a gruesome laboratory. Israel is the fourth largest arms dealer in the world. Little tiny David. Israel, you know, with the delights of you. Little tiny David is fourth largest arms dealer in the world. And uh, they market they market their uh, 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 weaponry and their, and their surveillance to places like China and India and other countries as, quote, to battle tested, field tested. Guess where? Guess where? The Israelis' new technology, new weaponry is field tested in Gaza. In addition, this is this is a, a, a wonderful. What it's horrible, but it's a wonderful uh, 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 resource by the uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. This is a Jewish organization in the United States called Deadly Exchange. They were where uh, 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 police chiefs, police captains, uh, homeland security uh, leaders, and others, state police, sheriff departments are sent to Israel to be trained by the Israeli military. And Israeli military leaders are brought to the United States to train local police, sheriff's departments, homeland security, and others. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a year in the major metropolitan areas. One example that you might remember, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, the Ferguson Police Department trained by the Israeli military. Protect and serve hardly. Just go to the Jewish Voice for Peace website and you can read all about that the exchange. It's really an important resource that they provide. And they've got, I mean, they, they can give you the, the statistics there. Already in 2012, the United States, I think it was UNESCO, the United Nations, I mean, warned that Gaza would be unlivable in 2020. In 2020, we're three years hence. Already in 2018, two years before 2020, the United Nations Special Rapporteur, Michael Link, uh, uh, said the following, that Gaza had already become unlivable. In 2018, the Palestinians decided that they would do a nonviolent protest. The Gazan, the Palestinians in Gaza decided they would do a, a, a nonviolent protest. They would march. They would march from the, the, the urban areas up to the fence separating Gaza from Israel. And um, every Friday, from March 2018 to December 2019, so about a year and a half. These were nonviolent demonstrations, no arms, and uh, um, uh, many Gazans were shot, including uh, medical personnel, many shot and killed. Uh, again, snipers picking them off from their bunkers uh, in the uh, in, inside of Israel. Again, walking up to the fence, nonviolently. Added to that, in 2018, Israel impo uh, uh, passes, the Knesset passes, what they call the Israel's nation state law. 
So it, it says that uh, there's the right to exercise national self-determination is unique to the Jewish people. So the Jewish people have this right for national self-determination in Israel. Excluding others. Up until this point, Hebrew and Arabic were both languages recognized nationally. Now Hebrew is prioritized as a, and it downgrades Arabic. And it establishes Jewish settlement as a national value. So all these settlers, all these settlers, anywhere from anywhere from the uh, Mediterranean to the Jordan River, in all the land, including the West Bank and Gaza, settlement becomes a national Israeli Jewish value. So, given all that, now I want you to sink back now to a previous slide. If today, 50% of the Palestinians are under the age of 18. And growing up from 2005, when this blockade begins, to today, that's 18 years. They've grown up under this oppressive, oppressive uh, uh, regime. They've grown up. They've grown up with the humiliation of a people where the whole idea of their history and culture is trying to be erased. They've grown up with poison fields and poison water and 60% unemployment. They've grown up with demolishing of homes six times since 2006. The military incursions and bombings. They've grown up with relatives and friends being killed by bombings and snipers and all the rest. So when I say that we condemn, do I, need to, I guess I'll say, need to say again, when we condemn Hamas's incursion and the killing of the 1,200 non-combatants in Israel on October the 7th, we also need to say that there's a context to that. It didn't just come out of nowhere because the Palestinians are, are terrorists or the Palestinians are subhuman. When you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and brutalize and squeeze some more, you get, you get this kind of armed, violent reaction. Not excusing it, but I wonder how many of us or how many of our children, or how many of Christians in the Western churches, you know, who try to keep a moral high ground and just say, bad Hamas. Wonder how many of us, you know, would, would uh, sit still for such oppression. These, these armed, uh, these militants who entered into Israel and performed such horrific atrocities on, on October 7th. They grew up. They grew up under this oppression. Not justifying it, but we need to understand that this came from somewhere. What about the response? Well, let's talk about some of them. Now, I'm wanting to leave a lot of time for questions because I know that you will have some. In 2009, the Christian leaders in the Holy Land, in Israel and Palestine, thought, you know, there's there's a precedence for there's a precedent for this. Uh, well, South Africa, 1985, the black the black church in South Africa, uh, the black church leaders got together and they produced what they call Kairos South Africa, the Kairos South Africa document, calling apartheid a Christian heresy and a sin and an evil. 
apartheid. I, like I say, I was just, uh, I'm led a group in the footsteps of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. My co-leader was a close personal friend of Desmond and Leah Tutu. And he was with us for the 14 days that we were there. And he was our Gala speaker a year ago, Edwin Harrison, priest, an Anglican priest, a close friend. And so we saw Cairo, South Africa firsthand. The Christian leaders, every bishop, church leader, patriarch in the Holy Land signed on to this document. We declare that any use of the Bible to legitimize or support political options and positions that are based on injustice imposed by one person or another or by one people or another, transform religion into human ideology and strip the word of God of its holiness, universality, and truth. We declare that the Israeli occupation, occupation of Palestinian land is a sin against God and humanity. Every one of them, Orthodox, Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, all of them, signed on with this ticket. In 2015, civil society, civil society in, um, <laughs> civil society in, uh, <laughs> Uh, Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians uh, started the movement to boycott divestment and sanctions just like in South Africa. Remember, remember President Reagan, Helmut Kohl in Germany, Margaret Thatcher in, in, the UK, in Great Britain? They all opposed sanctions on South Africa. They all opposed it. It was from the people in the churches that rose up and and were uh, 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 the motivational factors behind the boycott and divestment of South Africa. I'm sure the Mennonites were right in the, in the foreground with that. <laughs> You're right. We're still small. Yeah, I'm sure you were. I'm sure you were. In fact, by the way, you know who led the charge in the United States Senate? Senator Joe Biden. Hmm. Who's been pitiful with regard to Palestine. By the way, who also voted against Reagan? The freshman senator from Kentucky, Mitch McConnell, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but the goals, you can read the goals, right? Boycott the best of sanctions against uh, products uh, uh, and uh, uh, events and unrest in Israel. Fast forward. Here's a headline from the Jewish Israeli newspaper Baaretz. In 2017, the U.S. Mennonite Church folks divest itself from firms with ties to Israeli occupation. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> the point is that justice takes sides. Not all your friends in the struggle, not all your allies in the struggle are going to be, are going to do things the way you would want them to do. Some of them may do horrific things like Hamas on October the 7th that doesn't neutralize our work on behalf of justice for the Palestinians. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says he knows he knows apartheid when he sees it. It's worse in Israel than it was in South Africa, he says. Kairos Palestine then comes up. So Kairos Palestine issues this he issues this plea to Christians around the world in 2009. Please stand with us, please. Christian Zionism is a heresy. We're hurting. We need your support. The world is silent. So in 2020, Kairos Palestine reissues another call to Christians and churches all around the world. We're on the verge of a catastrophic collapse. Things are beyond urgent. Please recognize Israel as an apartheid state. 
in terms of international law and stand with us. David mentioned the Menno Pin, the Mennonite Palestine Israel Network. Talk to David uh, if, if you want to learn more about Menno Pin. I have a quote from Menno Pin at the end of the at the end of the talk today. But already in uh, in uh, 2011, I was one of the 11 who were gathered by the leadership of the United Church of Christ that went to Cleveland nationwide. 11 of us, and we formed UCC PIN, the United Church of Christ, Palestine Israel Network. The Presbyterians have it, the Methodists, I mean, all the mainline denominations, Q PIN, the Quaker Palestine Israel Network, all these various denominations have a Palestine Israel Network, and we gather together monthly. So really, I'd encourage you to talk, David, about Menno PIN. These all formed between 2010 and 2020, to try to have some sort of Christian, on a denominational level, right, uh, a response to what was going on in Palestine and Israel because they were crying out to us. They were crying out to us. And most of the churches, most of the world was silent. So could we replicate what happened in the 80s to South Africa when the churches rose up? Could we replicate that now for our friends in Palestine? That was the idea, and it's happening today. So let's talk about Hamas. We normally don't hear what, what this slide is telling us. We always hear about the Hamas Charter. The Hamas Charter about wiping Israel off the face of the map, you know, off the face of the map and all the rest of this. In 2017, Hamas recognized Israel and accepted Pal the Palestinian state within the 1967 borders. In other words, it recognized Israel's sovereignty over the 78% of the land and accepted that, that the Palestinian state would remain just on that 22% of the land. We don't hear this from even MSNBC, you know, well, we, who, they don't want to touch us except for Ali Belshi and uh, uh, Ayman uh, Mohaldeen and Mehdi Hassan. Rachel Manna, the invisible. Uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, invisible. All the rest of it, if you wish, would say something invisible on this issue. You don't hear this anywhere, anywhere on the corporate owned media in our country. Hmm. And they reiterated that this was not a religious war. They had nothing against the Jews who had been persecuted themselves during the Holocaust. They get it. The Palestinians get it that the Jews were persecuted in Europe during the Holocaust. Their question is, why did we make a European problem, European intolerance and the murder of Jews, why did we make that a Palestinian problem in Palestine? They just ship it. And we can talk about that a little later on, too, if you like, uh, uh, how the white Europeans shifted this to a different part of the brown skinned world to make this uh, their problem so they wouldn't have to own it and they could keep their consciences clear. I'm going to be interviewing, uh, did I bring that in? I'm going to be interviewing Nathan Thrall, who's a Jewish American uh, journalist who's been living in Jerusalem. He's a journalist living in Jerusalem. This is his latest book. It's a New York Times bestseller, A Day in the Life of Abed Salomon, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. He talks about this as a jailbreak like the Warsaw getting, what happened on October the 7th. A revolt of the hopeless, by the hopeless, for the hopeless. I've been calling it an act of desperation. Again, not justifying it, trying to understand the context. Why now? Why not a year ago, two years ago? Why, why now? We 
We have the most racist government, the Netanyahu government is the most racist government in Israel's history. And it just got worse and worse. Forgive me, but you know what that looks like with the previous president in our country. Palestinian overtures of peace have been rejected outright. The Abraham Accords instituted by the prior president, but still still now promulgated by President Biden. The Abraham Accords, what are they really about? They're trying to buy off the Arab countries with dollars and weaponry and other kinds of resources, excluding the Palestinians from the conversations. Excluding them. So when they peace here, 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 and here, as if that's going to bring peace to the Middle East, uh, excluding the Palestinians. And as we've seen, even when Palestinians resist nonviolently, the great march of return uh, for what boycott, divestment, and sanctions, how many states in this country, aren't there like two dozen or so, where it's illegal, illegal to support boycott, divestment, and sanctions? People are getting fired. People are getting censored, right, for, for supporting boycott, posting on Facebook. You know, retweeting, reposting, you get fired. <clears throat> Even when there's nonviolent resistance, it doesn't change a thing. Of the hopeless, by the hopeless, for the hope. There's a context to what happened on October the 7th. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, really, history repeats itself, you know, and two, I've learned from two of my Jewish friends, and they've been close friends. We've had them in Fort Wayne. Um, Mark Ellis talks about the uh, interfaith industry, the interfaith deal, he calls it the interfaith deal. Mark Braverman uh, talks about it as the fatal embrace, the title of his book. Remember I told you back in the back in the uh, 80s, I was part of this Jewish Christian dialogue group. For all those years, we heard from our Jewish friends, rightly so, about anti-Semitism which led to the Holocaust, and, and how it was even, we need to relook at our scriptures, and we need to relook at, at Christian tradition. We need to look, relook, I grew up, I'm a recovering Lutheran, so I, I grew up in Luther, you know, we had to relook at Luther, and Calvin, and you know, some of the reformers and their statements against Jews, and we had, we had to really take a close look at our traditions to see anti-Semitism there, and they were right for us to do that. What you could never talk about, if you want to have a relationship, is Israel, is Zionism. That's part of the deal, the interfaith deal. You don't talk about Zionism, you don't talk about Israel, and we can have good relations, neighbors, pastors and rabbis can have joint Thanksgiving services together, and we can, we can uh, petition the state uh, uh, legislature in Indianapolis together. We can work on community efforts together and all the rest. It's part of the deal. It's part of the interfaith industry. Mark Braverman was approached after a talk uh, by a Presbyterian pastor one time. He says this in the first pages of his book, Fatal Embrace. He was approached by a, a, a pastor who said, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I understand all this stuff about Israel, but you know, I've got this rabbi who's a friend, and, and you know, I, I just don't want to hurt our relationship, our friendship. He said, and Mark said to him, you got to do something else, something else with your Christian guilt. <laughs> if you want to be faithful to your Jesus, I hope I'm still up here so I can get questions, David. I'm going to scroll through these. These are a number of these are a number of statements now by Jewish and Christian organizations talking about the Israeli uh, regime and what's happened. 
So in 2021, that's Donald, right? This is a market, uh, a, a Jewish human rights group. It's an apartheid. It's a Jewish Israeli uh, group that we visit sometimes on my trips. An apartheid regime. Human Rights Watch. Crimes Against Humanity of, an, of Apartheid and Persecution in Israel. Human Rights Watch. Amnesty International. Israel's cruel policies of segregation, dispossession, exclusion clearly amount to apartheid. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes here, and I've only got a couple more slides after that. <coughs> Language is important. We used to talk about this as the Israel-Palestine conflict. That assumes, of course, right, that these are two equal sides, you know, fighting. But we know that that's not true. We used to call it about the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Well, of course, an occupation assumes that it's temporary. And then the occupiers leave. Well, it's been 75 years. <clears throat> Colonialism gets closer. But now, but, but in colonialism, the indigenous people stay and kind of serve the colonizers. Now you're going to hear more and more that this is called, by the way, Jewish uh, uh, advocates for Palestinian justice are the ones that first coined this term. Jewish Israelis call this settler colonialism. That is to say, the occupiers come and they stay and push the indigenous people out. What's happening in Gaza today? The mass transfer of milk up, up until this point, half the population out of Gaza. And it's happening already in the West Bank. It's happening in the West Bank. Mass transfer, population transfer, ethnic cleansing, genocide. It's a settler colonial apartheid regime. Jewish voice for peace. The loss of Israeli lives is being used by our government to justify the rush to genocide. So Jewish voice for peace is mourning the loss, right? They're condemning what happened on October the 7th. As we do. There's no justification, and yet we can understand. The loss of Israeli lives, they say, is being used by our government in the rush to genocide. If not now, another Jewish group. Stop using Jewish pain to justify Israeli massacres of Palestinians. Kairos Palestine, remember that group I told you about. All the leaders of the Christian churches in Palestine and Israel, they condemn all the violence, and yet it gets traced back to the illegal occupation of Palestine and the expansion of Jewish settlements and the violation of rights and all the rest. This is November 1st, just what? Uh, what, uh, 18, 19 days ago. The Christian leaders... They're begging us. They're begging us. By the way, the MCC, then I sent for me, signed on to this document uh, just uh, uh, a month ago. <clears throat> Publicly calling for a ceasefire, protection of all civilians, urging all parties to respect international humanitarian law. 66 organizations religious, as well as NGOs. And then the statement from Menopin strongly condemns the current violence carried out both by Hamas and the Israeli military. But they get it. It wasn't unprovoked. Gaza has been an open-air prison. The U.S. one-sided and national interest-driven diplomacy uh, and, and unwillingness to 
to engage with the uh, apartheid issue. Hopelessness breeds violence. I'll just close by saying, and then we have some time for questions. People ask me, you know, why this issue? There's all kinds of other issues, right, around the world. And if I know anything about this community, I know that you've been engaged for much of your lives with issues all around the globe, with refugee issues, Afghanistan. You've been all, many of you have traveled all around the globe uh, working in justice, social justice issues. And, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of what you've done. Why this? Well, $3.8 billion a year of our tax money. And our Christian sisters and brothers, those of you who identify as Christian, our sisters and brothers in Christ are begging us to do, to stand in solidarity with them. There are other, other issues too, geopolitical, but those two, those two seal the deal for me. So thanks everybody for having me.